Steve and Alan's Pro Tips in a short time learn a lot. Hey, Dennis Green. Hello, Steve Shanley. So Alan is at the Cincinnati Open this week, and I thought we would invite you, one of our Music Ed Insights insiders, to join me as a guest co-host. Well, now here I knew Alan was a man of many talents. I did not realize that he was a professional tennis player. Well, no, he's actually there with his wife just to watch the tennis. He's very much enjoying it from the crowd. Okay, well, I knew he was a runner, but if you would have said he was also a professional tennis player, that would have been a surprise. Well, we will miss Alan's talents this week, but luckily we have you, Dennis. You are among what ends up being a surprisingly large number of our audience members who do not teach music. I guess I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Yeah, I've spent my whole career in broadcasting. Radio in particular, number of different radio stations, different formats. But for some time now, I've been the general manager of a very unique radio station, KCCK in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, one of just about two dozen jazz radio stations in the entire country. And thus far, at least, we've been able to survive as a local music service in an algorithmic Spotify world. And so for our listeners who are not located in eastern Iowa, are they able to capitalize on KCCK being one of just a few jazz radio stations? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we stream uh, over the Internet like most stations do. We have our own free app in the Apple and uh, Android app stores, or you can just go to our website, kcck.org, and listen online. Anytime. And people do. Even people who live in major metropolitan areas. We have a few listeners in New York and Denver and L.A. who have a jazz station, but uh, like ours. Well, we appreciate you listening and are glad you find value in our episodes. Uh, interestingly, Alan and I have found that some of the best advice we have received during our careers in music education came from people who do not teach music. So you're smart successful, professional, any chance you've got a gem for us that you could share today? Well, I'm not sure about a gem, but in my job, I plan and produce and watch a lot of concerts and music events. And I'm a public speaker myself. And sometimes I wish that people who were performing music maybe took just a little bit more time to think and plan about what comes between those music selections. So to be a successful radio personality, you need to be able to convey information in a concise but entertaining fashion so your listener doesn't tune away. What's everybody's biggest complaint about radio, right? DJs who talk too much. So I don't want to be that guy. And not just on the radio, but the same thing applies You know, when you're public speaking. I also MC a lot of events every year. Same thing. Get your point across, then get off the stage. I'm betting that your listeners also regularly have to speak at back to school parent meetings, hosting concerts and things like that. You're absolutely correct. So I'm curious about your pointer. Is it be an amazing and naturally gifted public speaker like Dennis Green so you too can speak off the cuff at concerts and charm the audience? Oh, if it was only that easy. But to put in a framework that this audience in particular will find familiar, public speaking is actually really similar to performing music. When it's done well, it looks natural, easy, and spontaneous, but just like playing music, it requires practice and preparation to get to that point. We have a saying in radio that I think every musician and music teacher that's listening can relate to. Nothing sounds more spontaneous than hours of intensive preparation. All right. I love it. I'm intrigued. What do we need to know? Well, the most important thing to remember when you're talking in front of a group is when to stop. How many times have you been seeing a band, listening to a concert, they're introducing a song, it's really interesting, they start to wind up their story, and suddenly, you can see it in their face. They have no idea how to get out of their bit. They fail the dismount. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Their voice starts to trail off, and they usually end up mumbling something along the lines of, hope you enjoy. So my first tip is when you get to the end of what you want to say, just stop talking. Don't try to come up with some smooth segue, especially if you haven't pre-written or practiced it. Here's a public speaking secret. Often, the best segue is no segue at all. A really simple way that someone introducing pieces at a concert can do, and really clean, is to take a beat, pause at the end of a sentence, and then just 
repeat the name of the composer of the tune. Pause. George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. Yeah, simple enough. The other tip is don't be afraid to script out everything that you're going to say. Most people think that writing it all out ahead of time will make them sound stilted and artificial, but actually the opposite is true. The act of writing your remarks organizes your thoughts and acts as a rehearsal because you're delivering the script in your head as you write and think about it. Steve, you're just about the best at this as any director I've seen. You always have interesting content that enhances our enjoyment of the piece, and you're not afraid to let the audience see the page that you're working from. Well, I appreciate you saying that. That's high praise coming from you especially. And yes, for the concerts that we give with the Cedar Rapids Municipal Band in the summer and even my jazz band concerts throughout the year at Coe College, I just write all of my remarks out. And one theme on this podcast has been that Steve likes to save future Steve stress and work. And for me, when I am in the middle of a concert, there are so many things that I'm going to be thinking about, and I would rather just not have to think about what I'm going to say. So it's really helpful for me to just have it all written out. And in fact, when I am talking to the audience and just reading off of the script, that's kind of downtime for me. I get to sort of relax. And then when I turn around and have to interact with the musicians again, I can kind of turn it back on. And it's funny you mentioned not to be afraid using a printed script and letting the audience see it, because in the 20 or so years I've been going with that practice, I've heard, I bet hundreds of people say, I just love how you talk to the audience. And no one has said, why are you reading off of a piece of paper? Now, maybe they're saying that behind my back, but no one has actually said to my face, yeah, I, I really wish you wouldn't have that paper. I love that. Doing the prep ahead of time is saving future you some work and stress during the concert. Okay, one more quick one. Let's hear it. Every selection you direct or perform has a story that goes along with it. People love music. And that's the primary reason they come to your concerts, right? But people also love stories. If you can give them a good story about the history of the piece or performer, it adds a new dimension to the experience. And you don't do this for every piece, of course. And I know that for school concerts, especially, you're focused on getting the kids and their parents in and out. But consider taking 45 seconds or a minute, if you don't already, to give your audience a peek behind the mirror as to why you program this piece, why you love it, why it's important, why it's fun. And you might consider encouraging students to take up the intros and the narration too. Steve, you've seen this. This is something that we do on our jazz band camp with our middle school students. I mean, we get them started early. Here's our song. Introduce your fellow musicians. Say what you liked about the song or the camp. It's just like soloing. The younger we start them, the less nervous they'll be and the better they'll be at it as they grow and get better. Those are great ideas as well. And I was just thinking, as you were saying that, another reason to take 45 seconds or a minute to give the audience an interesting story is it allows the musicians time to turn off for a moment, whether they're professional musicians or school musicians, they can rest their chops, they can rest their brain. And that's a very good thing. So they don't have to be on for the entirety of the concert as well. Good point. And one other thing I have found when I am writing out my notes, if I do not practice speaking them out loud, every once in a while, I will get to a concert and I will read my remarks and realize, oh, this works if you are reading it. It doesn't sound great if you are listening to it. So it is kind of a different style of writing, as I'm sure you would agree, where you are writing something that will be read by an audience versus something that will be heard by an audience. And I kind of laugh because sometimes I'll look at my script for an upcoming concert and I think, oh, this is horrible. My high school English teacher would just be horrified at all of the rules I'm breaking, but it sounds a little bit more natural. So I encourage you, if you are going to write out a script, definitely also practice speaking it and don't be afraid to break some of those grammar rules so you can sound a little bit more natural. Oh, this is kind of my Achilles heel because with all the public speaking and events I do, I will cheat. I mean, I may write it all out, but then I may not read it through to myself beforehand. And nine times out of 10, the times when things don't go well, I stumble, I get confused, I get mixed up, I start skipping around is when I did not give everything a pre-read before I use it. So even if you've been doing it half your life, it's 
always, always important to put in that little bit of extra preparation. And while you're putting in that little bit of extra preparation, music teachers, remember that your audience may not be quite as familiar with terms that you and your musicians and your students just take for granted. They probably know, your students, your musicians, what dynamics are. It's entirely possible that you might use a term like that with your audience and half of them won't know what you're talking about. Don't be afraid to define those terms or to put them in different words that you're certain most of the audience is sure to appreciate and understand. It's that peek behind the curtain. You've given your audience a little window into the work that you and your students are doing, and they come away feeling like an insider. Well, Dennis, these are some great suggestions that we encourage our listeners to implement. And as with anything, folks, please feel free to start small. Even incorporating just one of Dennis's suggestions will certainly help your public speaking go more smoothly this year. Dennis, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for asking. Appreciate being your guest and good luck to all our teachers and listeners as they begin the new school year. Stephen Allen's Pro Tips in a Short Time Learning.